Good morning, Liberty Church. I'm Matt. I'm the lead pastor here. I want to extend a welcome to you. Uh, before we get into our scripture and our sermon for today, uh, you can see that in the inside back cover, there are a number of announcements for you. want to bring one of those to your attention, uh, and that is that uh, there does appear to be potentially some mold in the downstairs bathroom that sometimes the kids uh, will use when they're near their classes. So we have alerted the, um, the St. Mary's grounds crew, and so they will be getting uh, people in to evaluate that and treat that. But wanted to flag that for you. Especially there are upstairs bathrooms, so if, yeah, you might want to steer towards using those, and especially your kids to using those, and the uh, teachers downstairs know that as well. So just a little public service announcement there. Again, other announcements I encourage you to look at as you have opportunity. Uh, with that, I invite you to hear uh, God's word this morning. This summer, we're spending time in the parables of Jesus, uh, so I invite you to hear this as the living word of the living God. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Let us pray for understanding of this passage. Our Lord and God, as Ian reminded us just a moment ago, we are uh, so prone to the spectacle, the grand gesture, uh, the big show. Uh, we thank you that you challenge us in our expectations in so many ways, and we pray that as we reflect on this word, you'd help us to see uh, the often small, hidden, subtle ways that your kingdom works, and that it would give us great hope and encouragement for your work in our lives and the lives of those around us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this wasn't this past Monday morning, but it was a Monday morning when I woke up and I just didn't feel like getting out of bed. It was a couple years ago, so I was a young, uh, new in ministry, young parent, new homeowner, and I knew that all that awaited me was dirty dishes, and the laundry was piling up because our backed-up plumbing was sending soapy washing machine water back through our pipes, out through our water furnace, onto the basement floor. And on top of that, as soon as I woke up, I had that feeling in the back of your throat, so I'm getting sick. And worst of all, my favorite team the night before had blown the lead in the fourth quarter to lose, right? Everything was against me. But permeating all those individual frustrations and the external circumstances was a more general weariness that wondered, would it really matter if I just stayed in bed? What is what I have to do today really that important? Is any of it, does any of it really matter? Have you ever had one of those mornings, two or three of them? Maybe two or three of them last week? In these parables, Jesus helps us to see that, it's, that God is often at work in the small and the invisible moments in life, the times when we're wondering, does this really matter? In the kingdom of God, we see that big results often come from small beginnings and invisible activity often has widespread influence. So first, big results often come from small beginnings. Jesus begins his uh, first parable with a mustard seed because as he explains in verse 32, it is the smallest of all seeds. So I had intended to bring some mustard seeds from home. I forgot them. But fortunately, St. Mary's in the uh, kitchen there had some mustard seeds, which I'm going to make a mess of here. Let's just try not to send them all over the place. Okay, so after I get the extra ones off my hand, here is a mustard seed, a white mustard seed, which is the type that Jesus would have been speaking about. So it's pretty small, as you can see, or not, as the case may be. Mustard seeds were the go-to idiom for smallness in Jesus' day. That's quite humbling because Jesus regularly told his disciples, if only you had faith the size of a mustard seed. If only we could get you up to this level, right? 
That's Jesus' assessment of the faith of his closest disciples and friends. Smaller than small, not even on the growth chart. But Jesus' focus is not primarily on the smallness of the mustard seed. While it starts off tiny, the mustard seed becomes, as he says, the greatest of shrubs, the biggest of bushes. In good conditions, a mustard plant can actually grow to 10 or 12 feet tall, which is as high as a basketball hoop or beyond. The tiny seed becomes a plant that dwarfs everything else in the garden. And yet for Jesus, even that immense contrast between the tiny seed and the huge bush does not grasp the gulf between the kingdom's small beginnings and its final grand finale. Just as uh, in an earlier parable, the crop yields a miraculous hundredfold crop unheard of, so the mustard seed improbably becomes a tree, right? Which is not how you would describe even the largest of mustard plants. It's large enough for birds to not only perch, but to nest and live in its shade and protection. And in that language, Jesus is alluding to Daniel 4, where the king Nebuchadnezzar, uh, centuries before, referred to his Babylonian kingdom as an impossibly large tree that encompasses the entire world under which the animals of the field found shade and where birds of the heavens nested. Because in the ancient world, it was standard propaganda of the great pagan empires to liken themselves to enormous life-nourishing and life-giving trees. Don't look at the wars and the murder and the taxes that got them there, right? We are this wonderful paradise to be part of. And so what is God's kingdom like? It's a kingdom that will match and surpass even the greatest of earthly kingdoms and empires, both in grandeur as well as in membership, and will welcome and give shelter and home to peoples of distant nations that once looked to and relied upon the powerful, the oppressive, the tyrant. It begins small, but becomes gloriously grand. And that certainly matches with the shape of the gospel in history. So this is going to be super short because I know not all of us are history students or fans, but the story begins so small. A baby is born in a barn, and he's born there because of the decree of a distant empire, emperor of one of these empires. And then years later, he's a small-town carpenter, and he becomes an itinerant preacher. He is in a remote countryside in a backwater province. He only has a three-year ministry, and it's cut short because of unjust accusations, trumped-up charges, and collusion between threatened local elites and oppressive occupiers. And then his minuscule band of disciples scatters in fear as Jesus endures the shame and the pain of public execution. It should have ended there. Such a small, inglorious beginning. And yet three days later, there was an empty tomb. And the dead Jesus was alive again, walking and talking and teaching. And then those 11 disciples who remained became 120 in the city of Jerusalem, which became a few thousand in the city until they started spreading from city to city to city So they traveled, some of them, to the capital in Rome. And then three centuries later, the emperor himself publicly acknowledged that Christ was was Lord. And by that time, there may have been as much political calculation as personal conviction in that decision because a huge plurality, possibly a majority of the population, professed faith in Christ by then. Sociologist Rodney Stark calculates that such amazing growth could result from average annual conversion of just 3% per year. So you have a movement that begins as a community about the size of us that spreads through an entire empire, and it simply grew 3% per year. At the end of one year, you're a group of 100, and you have three more. And then the next year, you happen to have three more. But that happens year after year after year. 
at any point that would have seemed so modest, but the cumulative impact was amazing as the influence of the kingdom spread day in and day out, year in and year out, when worship service or conversation about faith or act of mercy at a time. And though we know the history less as the gospel went in other directions, Philip Jenkins' book, Lost Histories of Christianity, chronicles how Christianity thoroughly permeated the, con- the cultures of North Africa and Central Asia so that every major world power and empire that had previously oppressed Israel, Jesus' home community, Egypt, Persia, present-day Iran, Babylon and Assyria, present-day Iraq, were all, for nearly a millennium, vibrant centers of Christian faith. And actually, in his other scholarship about modern religious movements, Jenkins highlights that even today, while church attendance is in decline in much of Europe and North America, it is booming in the global south, so that Christianity is today the most widely professed faith on the planet, something that started so small, improbably, has become globe-spanning. But we still struggle to get, connect the grand vision of God's work in the past and the present and the future with the trivia and the trials of our days. We often feel like the character Val from A.S. Byatt's novel Possession. Val would not be drawn out to talk about her work, to which she almost never referred without the adjective menial. I must, just, I must do just a few more menial things before I go to bed, or more oddly, I was nearly run over on my menial way this morning. Some of us probably feel like Val some days. But when we struggle, struggle with the value and significance of our menial work and obligations, Jesus says it's the very nature of the kingdom to actually spread in subtle, hidden, invisible ways. We see this in the parable of the yeast. Jesus shifts from an agricultural setting to a kitchen scene. So a woman hides yeast in a batch of flour until the whole batch is leavened. Weird story, right? This is what, how Jesus would teach. Now, I'm even less of a cook than a gardener, so let me share some of my research into this strange and foreign concept of baking. Uh, I had to study up. Yeast is a rising agent like baking powder or baking soda, and anybody who's ever forgotten to put the necessary rising agent in their cookie dough, not that I know anything about this, uh, knows that there is a dramatic difference between leavened and unleavened cookies. One is delectable, the other inedible. Unleavened cookies are better projectiles than desserts. But in Jesus' time, you actually couldn't purchase a packet or a container of a separate rising agent from the grocery store. So instead, what a baker had to do is to keep some old dough from their last batch and then mix it into a new batch of flour. And then the already fermenting yeast from that old sample of dough would trigger the necessary chemical reaction so that the entire new batch was leavened. Some of us are so grateful at this moment for those little packets or jars uh, of rising agents. And again, Jesus' parable pushes our picture of the kingdom well beyond the ordinary. He uh, describes three measures of flour. That is, would be 50 pounds of flour. So if you purchase your flour in those five pound bags that they sell at the grocery store, it would be 10 of those. And this would be enough to feed at least 100 people. So you have the smallest of beginnings, just this little batch of dough that's mixed in and is necessary and yields the results for what would be an enormous banquet. The kingdom of God ultimately culminates in the gathering together of people from all nations to feast together with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it starts small, spreads subtly, spreads invisibly before the glorious uh, grand finale. So at the micro level, what does that mean for our everyday work and then also our experience of everyday faith? So first, our work. Whatever work God has called us to, 
whether it is paid or it's unpaid, whether it's in the classroom or the cubicle, whether it's in the truck cab or at the changing table, none of it, however menial it feels to us, is meaningless. Smallness is not the issue. Being seen is not the most important thing. But the goal, the purpose, or the destination. So maybe already right now, if you drive around town, you might see at schools or colleges, students who are out practicing already. And as you watch their practices, you might see athletes doing all kinds of repetitive, mundane drills. Some of them that don't actually look like anything to do with their sport. And they're doing that because they're working towards the goal of victory and teamwork and cohesion, each player contributing in the way that they've been trained in the weeks and the months before. In the same way, there are a lot of small, sometimes mundane tasks in our lives. So loving your family, whether that's your spouse or your children or your uh, siblings or parents, working hard as a student or as an employee, volunteering at your church or in your community that are central to the advance of the kingdom in untold ways that we may never guess at. Even Jesus, the Son of God, spent the majority of his life, the overwhelming majority of his life, 30 of roughly 33 years, as most, most scholars guess, in almost complete anonymity, growing up, loving his earthly parents and siblings, learning the family trade, working in construction, being part of his small town community. The kingdom works through our lives invisibly and gradually. How does that work out in our faith? Paul prays for the Ephesians at one point that they may be filled with all the fullness of God. So you take that together with this image that Jesus is using about the kingdom, and the translation is that faith in Jesus is a process. So if the kingdom advances gradually like a growing plant or spreading yeast, we need to reset our expectations of ourselves and of others. So in her book, Real Sex, Lauren Winner, who is now a professor at Duke Divinity School, shares a bit about how she became a Christian and how that unfolded in later years in her life. She says that she was raised in a, an observant Jewish community, and then she writes, as I graduated from college and moved to graduate school, I got pretty serious about Christianity and about Jesus. I was going to church regularly, praying to Jesus, thinking about him as I walked down the street, believing with a certainty that surprised me that he was who he said he was. I did some of the things you might expect someone who believes that Jesus is God to do. I got baptized. I started spending inordinate amounts of time with other Christians. I read the Gospels. I prayed the Psalms. I wore a small silver cross around my neck, proclaiming to passersby that I was part of this tribe whose allegiance was to Jesus. I knew that I was falling in love with this carpenter who died for my sins. But she goes on to explain how amidst all of that personal change, there were certain of her aspect, aspects of her life and behavior that remained quite intentionally unchanged. She says, there are other things that you might expect a Christian to do, and I did not do them. I didn't forswear sex. She says, I knew dimly that Christianity didn't look kindly on premarital sex, but I couldn't have told you very much about where those teachings came from. It would not have been too difficult, of course, to get more clarity on this issue, but I didn't really want to get more clarity on this issue because I wanted, she says, should the opportunity arise, the option of having sex. So a couple of relationships later, she is confessing other things to her Episcopal priest. And she mentions uh, sex in passing, and her priest said gently but firmly to her, well, Lauren, that is sin. And she says, in that moment, kneeling with another Christian whose sole task was to convey Christ's grace and forgiveness to me, something sunk in. I wish I could say that at that moment, everything changed, that I abandoned all that smacked of sexual sin and never looked back, but that's not true. She writes, honestly, what happened instead was that I had a failure of nerve. 
I suggested to my current boyfriend that we stop having sex. He balked, and so we continued. And thereafter, we broke up, and then I began the sometimes halting movement deeper into chastity. Sometimes I slipped up, had conversa hard conversations with friends, and then sometimes I laid on my bed and stared at the ceiling and wondered why this mattered, and occasionally I understood very well, indeed, why it mattered. Now, I use that story not primarily because it's about sex, even though that's a fairly common issue that people have dealt with about, uh, all through history. It's not a modern uh, challenge. But we could just as easily substitute a different individual story struggling with a different struggle. The cool thing about that story is she's so honest about the experience. We could substitute in a struggle but with honesty or with hypocrisy or with envy or with greed. Her story, though, is illuminating because it reflects the shape of how God works over time in our lives. One day there's just soil, and then you get a, bl a blade that shoots up, and it's a long way from the final grown plant that will one day be. With her, she had this faith in Jesus. It started with knowing who he was, that we don't emerge. And if you're a Christian, you might find that frustrating, that it takes time, that we don't emerge from the soil of faith as fully formed, fully sanctified saints, right? St. Matthew, St. Rebecca, St. Jim, St. Joe. That's not how Jesus works. And if you're a Christian, you might find that frustrating. And if you're not... That's why you might see all kinds of lingering inconsistencies with people who say that they are. It's actually part of the process. I'm not sure it's a feature, but it's not a bug. It's a process, and sometimes it's a struggle, but that's not proof of failure. It's proof God is working because he's refusing to leave us content with where we are. And that should sh shape how we treat each other. Paul says in Galatians 6, if anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Gradual kingdom growth should lead us to be patient as we long for God to change us and to change those around us and gentle with each other as it takes time to unfold over time. Just like Lauren's priest was gentle to her pointing to God's work in her life and encouraging her that God is forgiving and working. Even as each of us struggles with different things, whether it's struggling to believe aspects of who God says he is, whether it's struggling to trust who he is or struggling to obey what he calls us to. The kingdom starts small and then often spreads invisibly to end gloriously. And yet... Any given Monday morning, I may be laying in my bed grumbling because my team lost, my family needs me to do stuff, and my nose is running. But praise be to God that Jesus did not stay in bed when the heavenly alarm clock buzzed that it was time to leave heaven and to come and dwell among us, to lay aside his glory and to be conceived in the womb of Mary. Jesus did not hit the snooze button. He did not grumble, but he came to us and for us with purpose and with joy because he longed for you and for me to know him. Will there be days when life just feels flat? Yes, there will. I promise. Triumphs are few. Failures abound. Sometimes the computer screen stares back at you blankly. Sometimes the to-do list is longer at bedtime than when you woke up. And yet Jesus is still the gardener who is tending us. He is the baker who is kneading the dough, preparing for a feast. Jesus, though, he was God the Son who made all things became small. He became a human. He became a baby. He became an embryo that is smaller than a mustard seed. And he did that for you and for me. So that through the influence of his life and his death and his resurrection filtering through our lives and filtering through the world, people from every nation might find shelter and rest 
in his kingdom. No matter how you feel when you wake up each morning, if your hope rests in Jesus and what he's doing in the world, then the same power that raised him from the grave is at work in you so that you might know and experience the fullness of God in Christ Jesus. That is the good news in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.